to everybody an update uh, about lives being changed during this sermon series. As you guys know, we have been doing this sermon series about the assurance of salvation for a while now. Wanted to let you guys know that during our sermon series here at church, recently we've had three people that have accepted Jesus Christ, and now we have a total of seven people wanting to get baptized. Okay? So praise the Lord for that, that God is working in the hearts of people here at church for them to realize, I can't do this on my own. I need Jesus Christ to be my Lord and my Savior. I want to be born again with Jesus Christ. And so, every Sunday, I encourage you guys to be reading the Bible. Summertime should mean that we should have, hopefully, a little bit more time, and with more time, that means we need to be making sure that we make time to be able to be spending time in reading God's Word. J.C. Ryle, a pastor of a long time ago, he said, Let us read the Bible regularly, daily, and with fervent prayer, and become familiar with its contents. Let us receive nothing, believe nothing, follow nothing, which is not in the Bible, nor can be proved in the Bible. Let our rule of faith, our touchstone of all teaching, be the written word of God. So earlier this week, um, somebody reached out to me, and they, and they asked me a question. It was related to the content that's in here. And they wanted to know what I thought of this particular subject area. And you know what? It's not what I believe in. My belief, my opinion doesn't matter. This is truth, okay? So it doesn't matter what your opinion or what your thought is on a particular view. The truth needs to be found in the Bible. So sometimes when we speak, when we speak the truth of the Bible, that makes people uncomfortable. It doesn't make them feel good because the world's answers makes them feel good. But I'm not here in this world to share worldly answers. We as Christians, we are called to stand on the truth of the word, and that comes from the Bible. So the only way for you to stand on the truth of the Bible is for you to spend more time each and every day in the Bible. That's the only way it's going to happen. You're going to start preaching and teaching more worldly things if you're not spending time in here. And this is the reason why it's important for us to be in the Word each and every day. For today's sermon, I want you to understand in your head the message. But I also want my message to go down into your heart. We need to allow God's word to penetrate our heart. Because when we do that, it's going to impact your hands. What you do with your life is going to be different. This is the three H's of a sermon. So in order for our life to be transformed and changed, we have to apply the message that we hear into our life. What are we to do with God's word? We are to listen to it, which we are. We're hearing it. But that means that the same thing that we mean as parents when we say to our children, listen to me. If you are a parent, you know that you tell your kids, listen to me. And they shake their head and they're like, yes, I'm listening to you. But you know it's not going in. Too often, we as Christians, we're very guilty of this. I know. Okay. So what if you know? But are you doing? That's what God wants us. He wants us to be doing, he wants to be applying this into our life. This is today's comic, and it says, I saw the bright light and the tunnel, but they sent me back because I haven't finished paying my student loans. <laughs> How many of you guys are like, yep, student loans, don't try to pay them off. Okay, we got two. Anyone else? Okay, we got three, so I'm still trying to pay off my student loans, okay? May, you two? Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, yeah, I thought that was really funny. So this is our sermon series. We're talking about the assurance of salvation. This is part four of part five. Next week, Sunday, when you guys come back, it is, it's going to be the last one 
for this sermon series about the assurance of salvation. Just to give you all a heads up, I'm really excited about the summer sermon series. This entire summer, our sermon series is going to be dedicated to the parables of Jesus. So Jesus gave many, many parables in the three years that we were able to uh, understand him better. He said many of these parables, and so this entire summer, we're going to choose a few parables, and we're going to dissect that. We're going to dive in and try to examine some of these parables or the stories that Jesus taught. What are the truth, what are the meanings behind some of those parables? So I'm really excited for that summer sermon series that we're going to look into these parables. But until then, we're going to still talk about the assurance of salvation. Today's sermon title, it is titled this, Assurance Over Fear. So, fear not. So this is today's sermon question that I've asked myself. It is this. I fear that I've gone too far for God to save me. Is that correct? Well, guess what? I know in this church, there's a few of us that have really, really done things to the extreme. We've been shameful. We have been guilty. We feel that we have wronged God so many times. And you probably think, I have done so many horrible things to God. There probably is no way he's going to be able to save me. So today, we're going to examine that question. Are you beyond God's ability to save you? Is that correct? And so today, if there's only one thing I want you to walk and we remember, it is this. Have no fear that you can't be saved by Jesus. So nobody is too extreme. Nobody is too far out there that God cannot save you. So we've been talking about theology, and specifically, we've been talking about this topic of salvation. And salvation, again, several different definitions, saving of human beings from sin and its consequences, which include death and separation from God, or being rescued by God from the consequences of our wrongdoings. And then simply put, the easiest <laughs> one, salvation is being saved by Jesus. So to get us started for today, I wanted to ask you guys this question. Can you feel comfortable sharing with us what are some fears or phobias that you have out there? What's something that you're like definitely afraid of? Nikki? Heights. Heights? Is that why you didn't join the ladies yesterday when they went to the observation tower in the mountain? I had no clue about it, but unfortunately, what? I kind of... We've been announcing that for the last how many weeks? I've been sick. I've been gone. Nah, I, I guess know. Ben needs to be maybe a better messenger, so... <laughs> <laughs> It's All right, so Nikki says heights. Uh, Joan? Um, like closed-in spaces, I guess it's like claustrophobia. All right, yeah, being claustrophobic. Yeah. Austin? Being covered in ticks. Being covered in ticks? <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Janine? Spiders. Spiders. Anyone else? Mary? Okay, disappointment. Brother Ron? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Carter. Breaking something. Breaking something? Okay. All right. Mela. Snakes. Okay. Me too. All right. Does anybody know opidophobia? No. Okay. Anybody know what that fear is? Fear of the Bible. All right. It's the fear of snakes. All right. I have that fear too. Okay. So, I'm afraid, I'm definitely afraid of snakes. How many of you guys are like, yep, I've got that same phobia? Okay? All right, so there's many of us. Here's some facts and phobias. So, did you know that the average age of onset for specific phobias is 10? So, most people start their fears or start their phobias at the age of 10. That's very young. That's still in elementary school. Number two, specific phobia affects twice as many women as men. So I guess you ladies just have a lot more fears than us men. 
And this is the reason why Mela always says, Yao, this is the reason why I married you, so you can kill spiders for me. Okay? Alright? How many of you men get tasked with that job all the time? You're like the spider killer, okay? Last but not least, here's a sad statistic. Nearly 60% of people with phobias will make a suicide attempt. Okay? So there's, their fear or their phobia is so extreme to the point where 60% of the population have tried to commit suicide because of that fear. And so obviously there's like hundreds or if not thousands of phobias out there. And because of that, like I think the most prominent one that I hear a lot about is agoraphobia, which is the fear of just leaving your house, okay? And so you can imagine how bad COVID has made things too. Now people don't want to leave their house. And when you don't leave your house enough, some of you guys know, if you don't leave your house, it's depressing. And if you're depressed, your mind wanders to really bad thoughts. And that's not good, okay? All right, so how about this? How about thetophobia? What is this one of? Okay? How about this one? What do you guys think? All right. Then it's a phobia. This is the fear of death. Okay, so that's a real fear, is being afraid of dying. Now, how many of you guys, if you kind of can humble yourself, how many of you guys might think, I might have a slight thanatophobia? Raise your hand, please. Okay? All right. So that's like a quarter of this room. So perhaps the most debilitating thing in a person's life are their fears. If you really think about this, sometimes we can't seem to do things in our life because we've got all these fears that just pin us down that we're not able to do anything. Fear is unbelievably powerful. Fear can have so much control over your life. It is the power to stop everything in your tracks. Maybe you were doing so good and then all of a sudden there's this onset of fear or a phobia. And that stops you from doing the things that maybe you wanted to do. And so I truly believe that sometimes people are not able to do the things that they want to do. They might have a lot of goals, ambitions in life, but because of this constant fear or phobia that stops them from truly living the life that they want to live. If we allow fear to overcome us, it can paralyze us. It's going to make you not do the things that maybe you want to do. And sometimes in life, that's the worst position to be at. To know that you've got things to do, but you can't do that because now your fear is greater than your faith. And we as Christians, we have to be really careful of that to make sure that our fear does not overcome our faith. Because when that happens, we start to have trust issues with God. We start to lose our faith in God. You see, God loves us so much he does not want us to be paralyzed in faith, but instead he wants us to be growing in faith instead. Franklin D. Roosevelt, a great president of almost uh, 100 years ago, who here re remembers the great quote that Franklin D. Roosevelt said about fear? We have nothing to fear, but fear Yeah. FDR said the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself. So if you allow fear to take over your life, yeah, you're going to be able to be fearful of that. So fear is the only thing that we're afraid of. It's this concept of fear. Fear also has the great power to make you second guess and doubt everything that you thought that you knew and you believed. It's really sad. I grew up with people 
at my church. We went to Sunday school together. We were in the youth group together. We grew up together here in Wassa. And now for whatever reason, the faith that they had is no longer there because maybe they have allowed their fear to overcome that instead. And so if you start to have more fear, you're going to have some trust issues with God. You're going to start to doubt. You're going to have a uh, mistrust. And when that happens, you and I start to live in this world of fear. Can somebody give me your definition of fear? What is fear to you, Austin? Fear to me is after everything and run or face everything and rise. Okay. So maybe for you, Austin, fear is just running. Okay. So in psychology, okay, they talk about that they, and, and then they use the word flight. When you're fearful, you're going to just fly away. You're going to be taking flight. So I'm not going to deal with that or I'm too afraid. I'm leaving. Anybody else have a definition for fear? Okay. Cheryl. False evidence of fear is real. Okay. All right. So something that's not real to you, like, it is real. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Joan. Um, isolation. Isolation. Okay. This is my definition of fear. It is misuse of the imagination. When you're so fearful, your, your thoughts are running 100 miles an hour, and you're imagining all these things that are going to happen, when in reality, a lot of times it doesn't happen. How many times have you and I been up late at night because you're thinking about tomorrow? All the horrible things that's going to be happening tomorrow that you're fearing for. Well, guess what? It's because this thing is running 100 miles an hour telling you, look at all the horrible things that are going to be happening, when all that you're really doing is misusing your imagination to say bad things are going to happen. Your fear that you have can also be related to your salvation. If you have a lot of fear, eventually that's going to creep in, and that's also going to affect your assurance of your salvation. And why do I say this? I say this because if we're not careful, what we allow to happen is that we allow a little word. We allow a little idea from the devil. And if we're not careful to nip that in the butt right away, that little fear, it is going to manifest. It is going to grow. And when that idea related to your salvation, when it starts to grow, when it starts to manifest, we're going to be in scary situations. Sometimes if you're not careful, you allow these voices to say, look at the sin that you have committed. Look at what you have just done. Or sometimes it's not that one sin. Sometimes Satan reminds us, look at all the sins that you have committed in your entire life. Look at those things. And you call yourself a Christian. You're supposed to be a believer. You're supposed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. But if you are, how could you have just done that sin? How could you just have that thought? How could you just said those things? If we're not careful. Then the devil says, you can't believe that God would let a sinful person like you enter into heaven. No way. Look at your life of sin. There is no way that God would ever allow a sinful person like you to enter his kingdom. No way. That doesn't happen. It's only those that are sin-free. It's only those that are perfect. It's those other Christians that are, that are going to go. But you, look at your life. Look at your sins. You're not going to be able to go because of your sins. We allow those thoughts to continue to linger. If you're thinking to yourself, 
I am good for nothing, and because I am good for nothing, there's only one place that I'm going to, and that's to hell. What exactly happens is this. The power of fear that you used to have to say, you know what, I am going to go to heaven. All those fears, all those lies and doubts, now it's shifted from you thinking that you're going to go to heaven, but instead, now you're fearful that instead of going to heaven, you're just going to be going to hell. And so I want you to know, I need you to be encouraged today that yesterday's sin, that this morning's sin, you are never too far gone. You can't be locked up enough that you can't be saved. You couldn't have had so much drugs or alcohol that you can't be saved. You couldn't have done all these horrible sins and not be saved. God, God loves you so much. And it doesn't matter what you do. But God can still give you these two things. The first one is he can still give you forgiveness. And the reason why he's able to give us forgiveness is because we're going to him. And we're saying, God, I realize what I have done. And right now, I need your love. I need you to wipe away my sins. And when we do that, we're able to confess with our mouth. And when we're able to confess, then we need to repent. So not only should we just say it with our mouth, but instead, our mouth needs to then be followed with our heart. You can't be doing those things that you used to do anymore. We need to repent and turn away from that. This is the reason why in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. It doesn't matter the sins that you have done before. You see here, Jesus doesn't put any qualifiers. Jesus doesn't say, here are the sins that I'm able to forgive. Those are the little sins. And then if you've got the big sins, I'm going to give you three chances at those big sins. And if you strike them after three times with those big sins, I'm done with you. That's not how God operates. God just says, you need to come to me and confess and when we do that, God's words tell us, I am faithful to forgive you. So not only is God able to give us forgiveness, but God is then also able to give us salvation. He is able to give us life. So somebody once said that there are no hopeless situations. There are only people who have grown hopeless about them. And I think that's very true. You know, there are not hopeless situations that God can't help us through. Sometimes what ends up happening is that you live in that toxic environment of hopelessness. You start to believe that everything in your life is hopeless. Well, if that's what you start to think, then that becomes your reality. And so I want you guys to know that with Jesus Christ, everything is hopeful instead of hopeless. Jesus gives us that hope. So to God, no one is a lost cause. No one, no one, no one cannot be saved. God can save all of us, regardless of our past. And that's the reason why God leaves the 99 sheep to go and find that one lost sheep. We have a lot of people here in this church that you might feel like you're that one lost sheep. And I want you to know today that God loved you so much, he left 99 behind so that he can come and seek out that one. That one sheep was so valuable to God. God doesn't let anyone just go. But to those that are lost, he takes the time to find them to rescue their hearts. In Psalm chapter 56, verse 3 to 4, it says, But when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. I praise God for what he has promised. I trust in God. So why should I be afraid? There is nothing for us to be afraid of as long as our trust 
and our faith is in Christ alone. Here God assures us and comforts us that his love overwhelms everything that we have. We have nothing else to be afraid of. Today's Bible verse in Luke chapter 12, it says, So don't be afraid. Too often we're gripped by fear. We don't do things because we're afraid. And here Jesus says, I want you not to be afraid. We can go and rest in the comfort of Jesus' arm and not be afraid. Just like when a child is afraid, they run to their mom, they run to their dad in comfort when they're afraid. Here Jesus says, you can run to me. You don't have to be afraid. I want you to come to me, and I am going to be that mighty fortress. I am going to be that love that you need. So don't be afraid, little flock. And that's, that's all that we are. All of us, we're a bunch of lost little sheep. Jesus knows that. That's the reason why Jesus says, I am the great shepherd. And this is the reason why when he talks to us, he's like, you all, you're kind of those lost little sheep. You belong to the flock. And sometimes we should be staying together, but instead we go off track and we get lost. But when we get lost, Jesus says, I'm going to come and find you. For it gives your father great happiness. Jesus loves you so much, he doesn't want you to be lost. Our father in heaven says, I just want to give you happiness. And here's the reality. When you're lost, you ain't happy. But when you're found, that's when we find happiness. And so Jesus says, I want to find you so that I can give you happiness, so that I can give you the kingdom. So here, Jesus says, if you want to know what happiness is, it's really simple. Happiness is in heaven. And so when we have found Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, he says, I'm going to give you that happiness. And that happiness is known through my ticket that I'm going to give to you, that you're going to be going to one place and one place only when you leave this body, that we're going to be going with them. God wants to, to give you this free gift of salvation when you believe in him. This is the only way for us to be able to receive this gift. It is through our belief in his son, Jesus Christ. So Martha and Mary, in the Bible, they tell us the story of Lazarus. Lazarus was already dead for a few days when Jesus is able to finally come to the funeral. And Martha cries to Jesus regarding the death of, of her brother Lazarus. So in John chapter 11, I want you to pay attention to the words that Jesus spoke to Martha as she's crying about the death of her brother. This is what Jesus said. He spoke. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. So Jesus says to Martha, Martha, don't you worry. Life is found through me, and anyone who believes in me will live. You see, Lazarus is not dead. Lazarus is alive. Because I know that Lazarus believed in me, even after they're dead. You guys, we have no fear of death. We don't need to be worrying about thanatophobia. We don't, we don't need to be worried about dying. Because here Jesus says, when you have me, there is no death. Because even after you die, you're going to be raised to life in Jesus Christ. So don't you fear death. Because Jesus says, I am life. The resurrection is through me. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Yeah, this body's going to die, but it's okay. 
Because the most important thing is their spirit and their soul. And Jesus says, that's never going to die. That's just going to be me. And so then Jesus says, do you believe this, Martha? So here's my question to you today. That very last sentence where Jesus says, do you believe this, Martha? I want you to take out Martha's name. I want you to insert your name. I am resurrection and life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Put your name in it. Do you believe in what Jesus said? Because if you do, if you can insert your name on there, and if you can nod, and if you can believe, then Jesus says, don't you worry. You have life with me. And that's the gospel message. Jesus loves you so much, okay? We won't die because he has victory over our death. Jesus died once a long time ago so that you and I can have life. That's the love that he showed us. And because of this, we don't have to be afraid of dying. Because in dying, this will go to the ground, but the heart and the spirit will continue to live for all eternity with Jesus Christ. And what a beautiful day that that is. That I'm going to see you out there. That you're going to see us out there. You see, here's the reality. Some of us, okay, some of us are just closer to the front of the line. Some of us are a little bit further back in the line. But if you and I, if we're all on that same line, because there's only two lines. There is the line to hell, and then there is the line to heaven. If you and I are in that same line, we're all going to get through that same narrow door, but at the end, we all get to one final destination. Some of you might have been chilling with Jesus a little bit longer, some of you might be behind me. Some of you guys meet, might be in front of me. But it doesn't matter the time. The most important thing is the place. We're all going to get to that same place together. So when it comes to salvation, in life, sometimes we see the storms. And when those storms come, I'm telling you, do not lose your salvation. Those storms sometimes come in the way of addiction. It comes in the way of relationships. It comes in the way of finances. It comes in the way of our family, in our friends. I do not want those storms of life to compromise your salvation. Because you know what? One day, when you and I stand in front of Jesus, and he said, hey, you used to have faith. What happened? Jesus is not going to, to accept this answer. Well, that person made me lose my faith. That's not going to be good enough. Your salvation is yours alone. And your answer to say, well, you know what? My family, my friends... They made me lose my salvation. That's not going to cut it with God. And so we need to make sure that when the storms of life happen, that we are rock solid in our salvation. And sometimes you might go under. Sometimes in life, your faith is going to be challenged. You're going to slip. You might go under the water. But when that happens... Maybe it's this week, maybe it's next month, maybe it's next year. Things are going to come into our life that's going to cause us to lose track, to fall into that deep water. But when that happens, continue to reach out because Jesus is always there to reach down to say, my salvation is always for you. So fear not. 
Fear not is actually the most repeated command in the Bible. It tells you not to fear. So whatever fear that you have, especially related to your salvation, the Bible reminds us, do not be afraid. Fear not is in the Bible 365 times. Once we have our assurance of salvation, we don't have to live in 365 days of fear anymore. But instead, we can live in 365 days in our assurance of our salvation. So God gives us a do not fear each and every day for the entire 365 days of the year. So when you wake up in the morning, I want you to remember that whatever challenges, whatever fears that you have going on, when we wake up in the morning, Jesus says, I've got you covered. Do not fear. Here at the end, I want to inspire all of you with this really powerful testimony. This is called From Hell to Heaven, One Man's Journey to Life-Changing Faith. Not believing that, that hell was real. I said, you know, I didn't want to believe in all that dark stuff, you know. I, there's no hell. That's what I thought. But there is a hell. Jordan Samuel believes there's a hell because he believes he's been there. I could hear cackling, like laughing. <laughs> like laughing with demons. I could hear stuff. Earlier in his life, he never believed hell existed. If I live my life and do the best I can do, like karma-wise, you know, goes around, comes around, I'll just be the best man that I can be. He grew up in Edmonton, British Columbia with a single mom and went to a Catholic school. He was naturally inquisitive and asked a lot of questions about Jesus. How could one man come and just die for me? And, you know, who is this guy? And for that, he was kicked out of class. But my third time getting kicked out of class, I remember saying, you know what? I never want to know this Jesus guy. Whoever he is, he just gets me in trouble and I just get kicked out of class and no one wants to give me answers about him and this is how people treat me. I don't want to know him. His mom married and for the next 15 years, Jordan says his family life was great. Then his mom and stepdad divorced. Jordan was devastated. The only way he knew how to deal with the pain was to rebel. So whether that was drinking and driving with buddies and underage driving, stealing cars and, you know, getting stereos and having the thrill of, you know, almost someone catching you, but not quite. For the next four years, Jordan continued his reckless behavior, but he wanted to turn his life around. So he stopped selling drugs and started working for an oil rig company. I was making really good money and really good house. After work one day, Jordan decided to smoke some pot. He didn't know the pipe he used was laced with crack cocaine, something he had never done before. Jordan was sure he was dying. Can you feel my heart going boop, 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 slowly down, boop, 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 and then like flutter. Jordan believes in that moment he went to hell. All these women and all the things you think you want in the world, money, car, success, you know, um, all these things that I had and I was driving, I was just loving it. And then all of a sudden this car broke down. <sighs> all of a sudden these women turned to huge, huge demons. And the, it, it, it earthquaked. And I looked behind me and I could hear screaming, it's all red and black. <sighs> turn around, turn around, get out of here. It sounded like people burn, people that were just just burning that couldn't find a cure or a fix to anything. It was just the worst. And I remember being afraid, gripping the steering wheel. And all of a sudden, I was like, I'm back to my body in the trailer room. As Jordan was taking what he thought was his last breath, he made a declaration of faith to God. And my heart's went, like the last beat. Not even knowing why, I just said, Believe. And all of a sudden, boom, I'm gone. That's when Jordan says Jesus pulled him out of hell and took him to heaven. He was all in white. He was in a robe when I saw him. 
And he looked at me and he wears a crown on his head. His eyes are fierce like fire, but there is no like, like color, just bright looking at me. And he's just, he's like, just, he just is amazing. You're at his feet, you're at the Lord's feet because he's just perfect. You worship him because he's the almighty. You worship him because he's, he's, he saved us. Then Jordan believes he was standing before God. The Lord went to the right hand of the father and I began to get judged by the father and it was the worst because what happened was he, he played secrets in my heart that I locked with that I only knew that I ever did. I thought no one could do it. I could feel what God felt and I said, Lord, forgive me. Like it was the worst feeling. And he just comes in and he hugs you. He says, all is forgiven. My old heart was, was broken. My old heart needed fixing. And God gave me a new heart. All of a sudden, he told me he loved me, that I'm not alone, that I've never been alone. He showed me all the times in my life where I thought I was lucky, that I thought I was alone, but how his hand was always just upon me. And he was always right there pursuing me nonstop. He hugged me again told me he loved me. And all of a sudden I was like, <sighs> back in my chair room on the floor. I grabbed the Bible. It was like it was glowing and I held it. <sighs> I opened up the Bible. First thing I ever read out of the Bible was Psalms 34. The happiness of those who trust in God. I began to read it, it was everything that just happened. Only God can do that. Jordan shared his journey to heaven and hell with his girlfriend, Danica. His voice changed, his eyes changed, his body language changed. Everything about him was new. It was different. So there was no doubting that he had had the experience that he did. My mouth, my words, swearing, everything was like cleanse, like cleanse. I was delivered from any addiction I had. Today, Jordan and Danica are married with two children. They're missionaries preaching the gospel around the world. They're letting everyone know Jesus is real and that he can change the most hardened heart with his love. God loves the broken and loves the lost and he doesn't give up on them. He loves them with all his heart. He leaves the flock to find the one and he did. All right, so just a really powerful testimony about how God loves us so much that he's willing to do whatever to help us. So you are not so far-fetched that you can't be saved. Jesus Christ wants to save you. If you're that one lost sheep, he says, I'm here. And so today, if some of you guys are here and you're like, I'm not sure about my salvation, but all these things that I've talked to you guys about, if you're like, I believe it, but I'm not sure if I have salvation, in a little bit, I want you to pray with me for Jesus Christ to come into your life so that you can have salvation. So we're going to do that in a little bit. But to everyone else, if you've already been saved, if you've already accepted Jesus Christ into your life, I want you to think about this question. Are you living in fear or assurance when it comes to your salvation? I want you to pray about that for one minute. And to everyone else that today, if you want to receive salvation, everybody please close your eyes. If you want to receive salvation today, because maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior before, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I am a sinner, but you died for me. Jesus Christ, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior.
take control of my life from this day forward. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I pray all these things in Jesus Christ's precious holy name. Amen. So, I don't know who out there, but if you now just accepted Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, please come and see me after church. I would really want to talk to you. So here at the end, this is the reason why today's sermon question was this. I fear that I'm too far gone for God to save me. Is that correct? And the answer is, you should have no fear that you can't be saved by Jesus. We're all savable. And that's the reason why today's sermon titled, I titled this, Assurance Over Fear. Let us pray together, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given for us. We thank you for uh, this sermon, Lord God, that sometimes our fear overwhelms our assurance of our salvation. Lord God, continually remind our hearts, Lord God, that despite the sins, Lord God, it is possible. Lord God, that you do love us, that you want to save us. And Lord God, that your love overwhelms any obstacles that we may be going through in our life. We thank you for the message and the word today. We pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.